All right, welcome to episode nine. In this episode, we're going to talk about buses and tri-state outputs, and these are the fundamental mechanisms that allow us to add arbitrary numbers of devices to our microcomputer system. We'll talk about bus control signals, and essentially these synchronize data transfers between the CPU and the other devices in the system that the CPU communicates with. We will add a ROM device and also an 8-bit output port to our uh, to our system, and we will show actual code execution using a prototype version of the, of the circuit. All right, let's get started. All right, so here is an overview of a typical 8-bit microcomputer system. We have our CPU. We have some devices that the CPU interacts with. Um, a RAM device, a ROM device, a UART device for serial communications. We certainly could have other uh, types of devices in our system. Fundamentally, the way that the CPU um, exchanges information with these other devices is via the data bus. And the data bus is simply uh, eight parallel connections that um, basically common circuit nodes that connect to common pins on the CPU and all of these various devices. So for example, here is one data bus uh, pin on the CPU going to this data bus line and that is electrically connected to uh, pins on all of the devices that are uh, participating in communicating over this data bus. All right, so let's get a sense of how the CPU actually uses the data bus to communicate with these, these other devices. And uh, as an example, let's say that the CPU wants to store one byte of data in uh, one of the memory locations within the RAM device. So here is what happens. Uh, the CPU will assert the precise address of the memory location that it wants to write to onto the address bus. Um, the address decoding logic uh, determines that that address corresponds to the RAM and generates a chip enable signal for the RAM. And so the RAM wakes up and now the RAM knows that the CPU wants to communicate with it. The CPU uh, asserts the precise data value that it wants to write to the RAM onto these uh, eight uh, data bus lines. So in other words, it takes its own uh, eight pins that are connected to the data bus, configures them as output, and uh, generates high or low voltages on each data bus line according to the precise uh, one byte of information that it wants to store. And uh, those high and low voltages then are fed into uh, the data bus lines on the RAM, which the RAM will configure as inputs. And so the RAM device now uh, takes those eight bit values on the data bus lines, um, and it also looks at the uh, address bus signals that are specifying the precise address that the CPU wants to write to, which will uh, select one storage location within the RAM, and then the RAM takes those uh, those, those eight bits of information and stores them in the appropriate place. All right, so there's one very important detail that we need to discuss at this point, which is um, to observe that all of these devices, the CPU and the various uh, devices that the CPU is communicating with, uh, are all at least potentially capable of outputting digital voltages onto these data bus lines. So definitely the CPU can output voltages onto the data bus if it wants to write a byte of data in order to send it to uh, one of these other devices. But of course, sometimes the CPU wants to read data from, one, from a device. And so for example, if the CPU wants to, let's say, read a byte from the ROM, the ROM needs to output uh, voltages to these data bus lines so that the CPU can read them. And if you recall back to our initial discussion of digital logic uh, quite a few videos ago, um, we, we noted at that time that in general it's a really bad idea to have two digital outputs connected to the same circuit node. Um, you know, it's fine to have a single output connected to a node that has multiple inputs, but in general, you know, if, if two digital uh, outputs are connected to the same circuit node, and especially if they are both trying to generate different voltage levels, uh, essentially you have a short circuit and, uh, you know, the, the, that is not a good situation. So how is it possible, you know, that, that we have all of these different devices, at least under some circumstances, um, outputting to uh, the data bus lines. So there are two answers to this question. Um, Tri-state outputs and bi-directional I.O. pins. 
All right, so what a tri-state output is, is it is an output that can be just a normal output that generates high or low voltages, but tri-state outputs also have a, a state uh, in which the output essentially removes itself from the circuit node. It, and in fact, when a tri-state output is in high impedance mode, is, is what it's called, uh, essentially it's as though there is a very large resistor between the circuit node and the actual uh, output. And, and so in, in some sense, um, when an output goes into uh, the high impedance mode, it is no longer really electrically connected to uh, the circuit node that it is actually connected to. And that way, uh, as long as you can guarantee that for a particular circuit node, at most one tri-state output will truly be generating a, di a digital voltage at that node, there is essentially no problem because uh, as long as uh, only one output is really outputting a voltage and the other outputs are in high impedance mode, uh, there's no problem. You're not going to have any kind of situation where uh, the, um, the outputs generated by different devices are going to conflict with each other. And the other uh, type of situation where it's fine to have sort of multiple outputs connected to a common node is when you have bidirectional I.O. pins, which are um, pins of advice that can be connected to a circuit node and depending on the state of the device, be either configured as an input or an output. And uh, when a bidirectional I.O. pin is connected, uh, is configured as an input, it's very much like a tri-state output in high impedance mode, uh, because we know that in general it's fine to have as many inputs as you want uh, connected to a single circuit node. So um, again, you know, when you have, you know, multiple um, devices that have a, a pin connected to a common circuit node, uh, as long as only one is configured as a true output and all of the other ones are either tri-state outputs in a high Im impedance state or a bidirectional I.O. pin configured as an input, then you're perfectly fine, you know, because only one device will actually be trying to uh, generate an actual digital voltage at that node. So, so that is the key to understanding how data buses work. Only one device may be configured as an output onto the data bus lines at any time. And this is one of the most important functions of the glue logic is to guarantee that this is always the case, that you never have two different devices trying to be outputs at the same time on the data bus. So there's one more crucial detail we need to figure out, which is when the CPU is going to communicate with one of these devices, how do the devices know whether the CPU wants to write data to them or read data from them? And the way that works is that the CPU will generate uh, two signals, and let's call those um, R and W for read and write. When the CPU asserts the R signal, it means that it wants to read data. When the CPU asserts the write signal, it means it wants to write data. So for example, um, here is the RAM device, and let's say the CPU wants to read a byte of data from the RAM. Well, it'll generate an address that, that selects the RAM, so the RAM's chip enable signal will be asserted, and that will be fed to the enable pin on the RAM, so the RAM knows that, it, that the CPU wants to access it. But the CPU will also assert this, this read signal, uh, which is connected to a pin on the RAM called uh, OE, which stands for output enable. And the combination of its enable being asserted and the output enable being asserted, that is the sufficient condition for the RAM to look at the address that's generated, fetch uh, that data value from its internal storage, and assert that data on, on the data bus lines so that it can be fed to the CPU. Uh, similarly, uh, let's say that the CPU wants to write data to the RAM. Well, you know, it, it generates the address for the RAM, that generates the chip enable signal, but the CPU will assert the W 
output, its write output, that will be connected to a pin on the RAM, which is called WE, write enable. Now, uh, the combination of the chip enable being asserted and write enable being asserted, that tells the RAM, hey, the CPU is trying to send me data. And so it will read the data that the CPU is asserting on the data bus. Um, again, look at the address that the CPU is generating to identify which storage location in the RAM is being accessed, and it will take that data, store it in the appropriate place. So uh, for all peripheral devices, the, the critical thing to understand is that for the peripheral device to wake up and actually do something, not only does the peripheral device's enable input need to be inserted, uh, asserted, uh, also either uh, the device's output enable on a read or write enable on a write needs to be asserted and no device will really wake up and do anything unless both of those conditions are met. All right, so in an ideal universe, our CPU would simply directly generate these read and write signals that all of our peripheral devices are going to expect in order to know when to either send data to the CPU or uh, accept data from the CPU. Uh, our 6809 CPU is going to make things a little bit more complicated for us. It has two important bus control signals, uh, the E signal and the RW signal. And the way that they work is that the E signal goes high when the CPU wants to either read data from a peripheral device or write data to a peripheral device. And then the RW signal dictates the direction of the transfer. So if, when RW is high, that means the CPU wants to read data from a device. When it is low, it means that the CPU wants to write data to a device. So somehow our glue logic is going to need to decode the E and RW signals and then generate these nice R and W signals that our devices are going to expect. All right, so the good news is that we don't actually need a whole lot of logic in order to generate these R and W signals that are going to tell devices when the CPU wants to read and write. We can do it with three NAND gates. So NAND gates, as you recall, uh, send their outputs low when both inputs are high and otherwise uh, produce a high output. So, um, so the way that we'll generate the R signal, the, which we want to go low when the CPU wants to read, uh, is we will simply feed E and RW into that NAND gate as input. So if E is high, meaning the CPU wants to read or write, and RW is high, meaning the CPU wants to read, the output goes low. And that means that uh, the devices know that the CPU wants to read some data. Similarly, uh, the W signal goes low when E is high and when RW is low. And we use one, one NAND gate essentially as an inverter, uh, and its output is going to go high when RW is low. Uh, and so when E is high and RW is low, that causes uh, the, the output of this NAND gate to go low, and that's how our peripheral devices will know that the CPU wants to write data. All right, so here is our schematic, and what we have here is our uh, a reset c circuit, our 6809 CPU, our full glue logic, and that includes our address decoding that we showed in the last video. And then here are the NAND gates that are going to decode the 6809 bus control signals to generate our memory read and memory write signals that our uh, peripheral devices will need. And as the two devices we are going to have the CPU communicate with, we are going to have a ROM device, which of course is extremely useful uh, for storing code so that we can actually write programs and have the CPU execute those programs. And we are also going to add an 8-bit output port, and that 8-bit output port will control a seven-segment LED display, and that will allow us to write code that actually uh, displays some information, and that will give us uh, really good confirmation that our system is working and that the code that we write is actually executing correctly. All right, so let's just zoom in on the glue logic a little bit here. So here we can see the, the three NAND gates that decode the E and RW signals generated by the CPU. And the, the two signals that are generated 
by uh, this logic that decodes the bus control signals are, are, are labeled here as RMEM and WMEM, uh, the active low memory read signal and the active low memory write signal. Uh, those are exactly the same thing as the R and W signals that we talked about uh, just a moment ago. Next, let's zoom in on the, the ROM portion of the schematic and the specific ROM device that we're gonna use is the 28C256. Uh, that is a 32K um, EEPROM device, electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. Um, in the last video, you may recall I suggested using a particular 64K uh, WinBond um, EEPROM device. I, I would actually not recommend using that. Uh, the problem is the, the device that I suggested, which I think is the W25C512, uh, requires special programming voltages, and there's essentially no hope of programming it unless you have uh, a dedicated programmer device. Um, these 28C256 devices uh, are programmable using um, 5 volt logic, meaning that you can program them with things like Arduinos, so it might be a better choice. Uh, certainly, these are, these are widely available, and you know they'll work really well in this application. Uh, so uh, I, that's what I would recommend that you use. Okay, so um, the signals that uh, this device requires are, of course, um, it requires 15 address signals that is required to. Uh, select one of the two to the 15 possible uh, memory locations that exist within this, uh, this ROM. Uh, the device, of course, also needs to connect to the data bus, so that's the D0 through D7 signals. Here we see the, uh, the RMEM signal, so uh, that's generated by the glue logic when it detects that the CPU is trying to read from a device. Uh, and then this ROM N signal, that is the, uh, the chip enable signal that is generated by the address decoding logic when it detects an address that corresponds to uh, one of the memory locations that are in the ROM device. All right, as the last thing that we'll look at in the schematic, let's look at this 8-bit output port. So the 8-bit output port is a 748CT574 device. It is essentially eight D-type flip-flops with a common clock. The outputs of the flip-flop are connected to the uh, various uh, segment cathodes of a common anode seven-segment LED display. And so essentially when, the, uh, when this device outputs low voltages on these outputs, current will flow through the common anode uh, through the LED driving the particular segment and essentially the segment will light up. So basically when these are low, the segment will, the corresponding segment will light up and when they're high, the corresponding segment will not be lit. So um, essentially we're going to map this, uh, th this output port into the address space of the system, and this is where we're actually going to use one of our uh, chip enables that we have decoded in our I.O. region, and specifically we're going to use the I.O. Dev 0 uh, chip enable that corresponds to uh, addresses at hex 8000, basically the very beginning of the I.O. region, and we're going to use an OR gate, and so when the, C, when the uh, glue logic's memory write signal goes low and, and is asserted, meaning that we know that the CPU wants to write data, and also when this I.O. Dev 0 goes low, when both of those are low, that causes this output to go low, and then the moment that either of these is de-asserted, um, our OR gate is going to go high again, and that is what will uh, generate the clock pulse that latches the data that the CPU is writing into uh, the, the eight flip-flops, and essentially uh, that will then continue to generate those outputs on the outputs of, of the device. All right, now that we've talked about the schematic, let's talk about how to actually construct the circuit on the breadboard. And I have a series of five recommendations that I think if you follow uh, will give you the best possible chance of getting a working circuit. The first recommendation is to use a ZIF socket, zero insertion force socket, for the ROM chip. And as you work on the firmware, 
uh, for the system, you're going to be uh, needing to in remove and in reinsert this this uh, this ROM chip because you, you know as you write new code, you're going to need to take it out of the circuit, put it in your program, or program it, uh, put it back in the circuit. And if you try to do this repeatedly by inserting the pins of the ROM chip uh, directly into the holes in the breadboard, it's going to put a lot of mechanical stress on the pins of the ROM chip, and eventually they will break. They're just not really designed to uh, to undergo you know, repeated insertion and removal cycles that way. So a, a zip socket's uh, perfect because uh, you um, release the lever, pop it out, comes right out, no strain on the pins, program it, put it back in, uh, put the lever down again, and now you've got nice electrical connections and you can do this essentially any number of times without damaging the chip. Now, the problem with zip sockets is that they, um, they have relatively short pins and uh, they're not really breadboard friendly. You can stick them in a breadboard, but in general, uh, the pins are too short to make good electrical connections. And that's not good because it means you'll get sort of intermittent uh, reliability issues with whatever device is in the zip socket. So what I do is to solder um, single row header pins onto the pins of the ZIF socket, and that makes them breadboard friendly. You can stick them right in. Uh, they make a nice solid connection. My second recommendation is, uh, as you are wiring up the circuit on the breadboard, uh, to be working from a printed copy of the schematic. And as you wire connections on the breadboard, uh, mark the corresponding point on the schematic as connected. So for example, here is the, uh, the schematic symbol for the ROM chip. And as I wired up the connections for the address bus and the data bus and uh, the other um, connections that needed to be made, I put a little check mark next to each one. And that is what gave me confidence uh, that the ROM chip was uh, correctly connected to the other places in the circuit it needed to be connected to. And basically your circuit is not gonna work unless every single connection that needs to be made is made. And so it's it definitely pays to be very methodical and systematic about making sure that those connections are made correctly. My third recommendation is to use your multimeter in continuity mode um, to check to see that you actually do have a good electrical connection for each connection in the circuit that needs to be made. So for example, um, the A0 uh, pin on the uh, CPU needs to be um, connected to the A0 input on the ROM chip. So that is pin 8 on the CPU and pin 10 on the, the ROM chip. So uh, I've got the multimeter in continuity mode. I put one multimeter lead on pin 8 of the CPU, and then I put one on pin 10 of the ROM chip. And the fact that the multimeter beeped shows that there is a low impedance uh, path between those two points of the circuit, and so that way I know that that uh, that connection really is truly made. And you will in general catch mistakes if you if you do this because it's very easy to just get a wire one row off uh, in the breadboard and now uh, two points in the circuit that shouldn't be connected um, are connected and you know the, the places that should have been connected aren't. So uh, it always pays a lot to, to double check your work and the uh, multimeter and continuity mode, very effective way to do that. My fourth recommendation is to avoid running wires over the top of chips. And, and one thing you will note is that for the most part, I have tried to route the wires between chips rather than over chips. Uh, th there is actually one exception here that I do have some uh, temporary jumpers that are going over this uh, 74HCT574 chip here. But in general, uh, the reason that you want to do this is that if you ever need to remove a chip, it's going to be virtually impossible if you have all kinds of wires that are running over the top of the chip. So, um, you know, there are various reasons why you might need to uh, take a chip out. Um, if you wire incorrectly and cause a short circuit, that can damage a chip. I have had uh, logic chips get, get fried by doing that. Uh, and so you might need to pop in a replacement. And uh, in general, you know, this gives you kind of maximum flexibility for being able to, um, you know, kind of change the construction of the circuit at a later time.
My fifth recommendation is just a general recommendation to think about the overall layout um, on the breadboard and how the chips are going to connect to each other and how you might place the chips in order to you know, minimize the length of the wires that you're going to have to run. And uh, one thing to note is that, you know, in general, you are probably not going to get a nice tidy breadboard layout for this type of circuit, uh, specifically because of the parallel data buses and, and address buses that just cause you, you know, to have all kinds of wires running all over the place. But um, in general, you know, if you can think about connections between chips and trying to get uh, and try to get chips that, um, you know, have connections to each other, close to each other in the breadboard layout, that will, um, you know, make your life a lot easier. Okay, so now that we've talked about the hardware, let's talk about the software. So this is the assembly program for the code that is going to be programmed into the ROM to uh, demonstrate the operation of the circuit. And um, this is uh, the blink.asm file. It's in the code directory associated with uh, the episode. All right, so at the beginning of the listing, uh, we have some uh, constant values that are defined. We have the address in memory of the output port at hex 8000. That's right at the beginning of the I.O. region. Uh, we have some constants defining uh, the, the values for the bits that uh, control the segments of the LED display. All right, so here is our code. Uh, you may recall from the memory map that the I.O. region occupies 4K of memory that otherwise would be mapped into the ROM. So in other words, there's going to be a 4K chunk of our ROM that is actually not used. Uh, so that's what this uh, code here does. It says that um, beginning at uh, address 8000, uh, we're just going to put in um, 4K worth of just uh, hex value FF, just you know junk. Uh, we'll never see that because the I.O. region is mapped at, uh, at that range of addresses. So our actual code begins at hex 9000, and that is the entry point of the program. Uh, and basically what our code does is it uses the B register, which is a, an 8-bit register, uh, as a counter. It will count from 0 to 15 and then cycle back to, uh, to 0. Uh, and then there is a main loop in the program which loads a bit pattern for one of the hex digits, uh, 0 through 15. Um, and there is a lookup table um, that uh, contains those bit patterns. Uh, it will load the appropriate bit pattern and then write it to the output port. So that will cause the uh, correct hex digit to be displayed on the seven segment uh, display. Uh, and then there is a delay loop that just counts from uh, 0 to uh, 2 to the 16 minus 1 using the 16-bit X register. So that's literally just to slow down the loop so that we can actually see uh, the digits being displayed. Uh, and then we increment B but then um, discard everything but the low four bits of B. So that ensures that when we count um, up from 15, that rather than going to 16, which can't be represented as a single hex digit, that we go back to zero. And uh, the main program just kind of executes this code over and over again. Uh, following the actual code, we have our bit patterns for the various um, hex digits. And uh, these are negated because uh, we're using an, uh, a common anode LED display, and we actually need to generate zeros to turn a segment on uh, rather than one. So that's why uh, all of these bit patterns are negated using the bitwise complement operator. Um, and then finally, uh, at the very end of the ROM, at address FFFE, that is the uh, reset vector, meaning that is um, that poor, that two bytes of the ROM needs to contain the address that the CPU should jump to when it comes out of reset. And uh, we simply put in the entry point of the program. So, so that means that the CPU, um, when it boots up, loads this reset vector, which contains this address, uh, which is the start of our program. Okay, to get our program onto our ROM device, we first need to assemble it, and that means uh, we need to run an assembler program to translate the human-readable assembly language code into the actual binary machine instructions that the CPU will execute. Um, and uh, to do that, I have uh, written a little make file. So the make file runs the ASM6809 assembler to translate our .asm assembly file into a .bin binary file. So uh, all we have to do is type make, uh, and that works. Uh, and what we will notice is that uh, blink.bin 
is the exact size of our ROM device. So that means that our binary data is going to completely fill uh, the EEPROM device in it. That's good. Okay, so now let's see how to uh, actually load this onto the ROM. So now to program our assembled code onto our uh, EEPROM device, I'm going to use the, uh, the MiniPro TL866 device programmer. Uh, this is a, a nice little USB device programmer. It can program a variety of ROM devices like EEPROMs and EEPROMs, and it can also program microcontrollers. Uh, definitely a, a very handy piece of equipment, and in general, this is going to make your life a lot easier because it is the, the quickest and easiest way to load code onto a ROM device. You can program 28C256 e EEPROMs using an Arduino, but that is going to be far more complicated than um, getting one of these device programmers. So if you're willing to spend, you know, 50 bucks or so, uh, I would very much recommend getting one of these. Um, okay, so uh, I've selected the correct device, uh, AT28C256, um, in the device selection, and I'm going to now uh, open our, our uh, blink.bin containing the assembled program. And uh, what we will notice is if uh, in the hex editor here, if we scroll to address 1000, meaning exactly 4K, into the data here, we can see our actual program code. And these are the uh, binary machine instructions that the CPU will be executing. Uh, we also have our uh, lookup table for our hex digits in here as well. But uh, even though it's a tiny program, you know, there it is. Uh, if we scroll all the way to the end of our data, right at the end of the ROM, we can see in the last two bytes, um, our uh, reset vector 9000. That's the address that the CPU will jump to uh, when it comes out of reset. So uh, that's definitely good to see. All right, so um, I have uh, loaded the uh, ROM device into the uh, zip socket on the programmer. And now all I need to do is hit the uh, program button here and then hit program on the dialog and that's gonna program our code onto the device. So there it goes, uh, this shouldn't take too long. And there we go. Okay, so at this point now, our code is programmed onto the EEPROM device. Okay, so now that we have loaded our program onto the ROM chip, let's power things up and see what happens. So I'm going to power on the uh, bench power supply here. And there we go. So as we expected, we do see the uh, uh, hex digit 0 through F being displayed on the seven segment display here. So everything does indeed seem to be working. All right, so to uh, look a little more closely at what is actually happening and specifically uh, to better understand the signals that are synchronizing the data transfers from the CPU uh, to this uh, 748CT574 chip that's actually driving the seven segment display, um, let's fire up the oscilloscope and look at several signals. And the specific ones I want to look at are uh, the E and RW signals that are generated by our CPU. And we know that those are further uh, decoded into the uh, memory read and memory write um, uh, signals that essentially tell the devices whether uh, the CPU wants to read or write. And I would also look, like to look at the uh, IO dev zero signal. So that is the, uh, the one that is um, uh, asserted for addresses that are in the very lowest part of the 4K IO region. Uh, and then I'm going to look at the output of this OR gate that actually generates the, uh, the clock edge that clocks data from the CPU into our 748CT574 device. All right, so uh, let's see what's happening on the scope. All right, so very quickly, uh, before we look at the uh, traces on the oscilloscope, uh, I want to explain why I'm not probing this memory write signal. Um, I only have four channels on the oscilloscope, and this memory write signal um, is, is simply derived from the E and RW signals. So if we understand um, how they are uh, how they are changing, we'll know implicitly what was generated uh, for this memory write signal. All right, I've got all my probes connected. Let's see how this works. All right, so here's the oscilloscope showing the signals that we're interested in. Uh, channel one is the E signal. 
Channel 2 is the RW signal. Channel 3 is the IO dev 0 signal. So that is the chip enable that's generated for the lowest addresses in the IO region. Uh, those are the addresses where our 574 output port is mapped. And channel 4 is showing the output of the OR gate that is uh, connected to the clock input of the 574. So essentially, uh, when we get a low to high transition on this signal, that is the point where data is clocked into the output port. So the trigger that we have set up is we are going to trigger on channel 4, so that is the clock input of the 574 output port, and we are going to trigger on a falling edge, meaning a transition from a high voltage to a low voltage. And when that uh, negative edge occurs, that is the essentially the precise moment that uh, we know that the CPU is attempting to store data in the output port. And, and what we're going to... Uh, look at on the on the scope is essentially what happens after that point. All right, let's do a single shot capture here so we can see exactly how the signals are changing at the point where um, this uh, input to the 574's clock um, goes low. All right, so here is our capture. And so here is the precise moment where uh, the clock input of the 574 went low. And so at this point, we know that the CPU is trying to store data uh, in that output port. So uh, what events led up to that? Well, here we can see uh, the RW signal uh, went low. Uh, we can also see here the IO dev 0 signal went low. So that means that the uh, address decoding logic had determined that the CPU was accessing a memory address that um, was in the very, very low part of the IO region. And that's where we have our output port mapped. So uh, at this point, we know that the CPU is, is uh, sort of ready to access um, the output port and to write data to it. Uh, however, um, this uh, clock edge doesn't actually go low until the E signal goes high. So it's essentially when the E signal is high that the glue logic knows that the CPU is trying to access memory. So immediately after this E signal goes high, that is the point where the, uh, the memory write signal is generated because that happens when E goes high and when RW is low. And then the OR gate, which is uh, computing the OR of uh, the memory write signal, which is active low, and this IO dev 0 signal, which is active low, the moment both of those go low, the output of the OR gate goes low. And so uh, this is the sort of the negative clock pulse, which indicates to the 574 output port that the CPU wants to store some data in it. Um, when, the, uh, when this clock signal goes high and we have a low to high transition, that is the point where data is uh, clocked into the output port. And uh, the, the point at which uh, this uh, positive edge occurred is precisely the point where E um, is uh, goes from high to low, meaning that the CPU has sort of uh, is finishing its memory transaction. And at that point, uh, data is clocked into the output port. So essentially here at this exact moment is when uh, the output ports uh, outputs are updated and this is the point where uh, a new hex digit is displayed on the LED display. Okay, so I think that's a good place to wrap things up. Um, next time, there are a few possibilities I'm thinking about. Uh, one is to show a much more minimal test program. The test program we looked at today was actually fairly involved and did rely on uh, a hardware device, specifically the output port. Uh, there's actually a really good way to uh, test to see if the system is working that only involves ROM. So uh, perhaps we'll uh, cover that. Um, we might uh, connect a UART device and start to develop a simple monitor program that allows the uh, the microcomputer system to communicate with our host PC. Uh, maybe we will add a uh, 82C55A uh, peripheral expander chip. Uh, there are all kinds of possibilities now, so stay tuned, and I will see you in the next video.